As war rages over political control of Ukraine, there's also been a war going on for spiritual control in what some have considered the most major split in Orthodox Christianity since the East-West Schism. But to understand it, we must take a step back and examine how the Orthodox Church operates. Prior to the East-West Schism, which divided the Church into Catholic and Orthodox, or as they are sometimes referred to by the other side, the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox, they were just one Church. Not to say that there weren't subdivisions in the Church. Even today, within the Catholic Church, you have the Latin Church and the Eastern Catholic Churches, all in communion and all under the authority of the Pope. And before the East-West Schism in 1054, there were separate administrations in the Church, too. If we go back to the time of Emperor Justinian of the Roman Empire, we find that he had established law regarding the Christian Church, stating that the government would be in a system called Pentarchy, the rule of five. Those five were the heads or patriarchs of the major Episcopal sees of the Roman Empire, which were Rome first, followed by Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. The Pentarchy system was never fully accepted by the Church, but it showed that an order of prominence was something that these various Episcopal sees were considering. The question of who has primacy and whether anyone should have supremacy within the Church was one of the major issues that caused the 1054 Schism. The churches that would become the Eastern Orthodox recognized Rome and the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, as first among equals. But these so-called Roman Catholics viewed the Pope of Rome as supreme not as an equal to the other patriarchs. So today, with the Catholics and Orthodox divided, for the Orthodox Church, Rome isn't currently in the picture. So the order of precedence begins with Constantinople and its patriarch as first among equals, followed by Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. And there's been more added. So if you continue, next is Russia, then Serbia, then Bulgaria, and so on. Now, what's interesting is that over time, though the precedence has not been rearranged, the number of people under the authority of each of these churches has changed drastically. Out of the approximate 220 million Eastern Orthodox believers, the Patriarchate of Constantinople has 5.25 million, Alexandria is over 500,000, Antioch is over 4.3 million, Jerusalem is over 400,000, and the Russian Orthodox Church is by far the largest with 100 million. There's plenty of others, like the Romanian Orthodox, which have 18 million or so, and the 10 million in the Church of Greece. These churches I've mentioned are all autocephalous, which means that they are churches whose highest bishop is not under the authority of any other bishop. And there's at least 14 of these churches. But there are two others which are disputed, which is where the issue between the Russians and the Ukrainians come into play. Here's the question that sets off the division. Who can establish a church as autocephalous? There are two possible answers. According to Constantinople, the first among equals, they alone have the right to finally approve an autocephalous church. According to the Russian Orthodox Church, any autocephalous church holds the exclusive right to divide off a church under its jurisdiction and make them autocephalous. Neither side views it as the right of secular government to make this decision. So when in 1832, when the government of Greece declared the Church of Greece to be autocephalous, the Orthodox churches rejected the claim. Finally, in 1850, it was accepted. But here's the catch. The Church of Greece was within the territory under the authority of the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople. So when they formally recognized the Church of Greece's independence, this didn't really settle the question of who can grant a church autocephaly. Yes, the church who was in control of the territory granted autocephaly, but it also happened to be the first among equals, Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople. So all the other churches recognized Greece as autocephalous. The same thing happened with the Bulgarian church, which became autocephalous from the Ecumenical Patriarchate and with the Serbian and Romanian churches. In 1917, things get interesting. The Russian Orthodox Church declared that the Georgian Orthodox Church was independent and autocephalous. The Ecumenical Patriarchate didn't recognize the ROC's authority to do this, but in 1990, they themselves declared the Georgian Church to be autocephalous, mending the rift. The Russian Orthodox Church also declared the Orthodox Church in America to be autocephalous in 1970, but the Ecumenical Patriarchate has never accepted this, so the autocephaly of the OCA is disputed. That's not to say that anyone views the OCA as not being a real church, just that they disagree on whether it's an autocephalous church. So now, let's take a look at the Russia-Ukraine situation. The Russian Orthodox Church itself was originally under the jurisdiction of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, but in 1448, it separated 
separated itself and was in schism for a while, until around 1560 when the Ecumenical Patriarchate restored relations. Around 1589 to 1591, the Ecumenical Patriarchate recognized the autocephalous status of the Russian Orthodox Church, also known as the Church or Patriarchate of Moscow. The church in Ukraine wasn't all part of the deal, but in 1686, the Ecumenical Patriarchate allowed the Moscow Patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church the right to appoint the Bishop of Kiev. The Russian Orthodox Church claims that this put the Metropolitanate of Kiev into the Russian Orthodox Church and that Constantinople no longer held authority there. But the Ecumenical Patriarchate says this was not the case, that Kiev remained within the Ecumenical Patriarchate's jurisdiction. In practice, over time, the Metropolitanate of Kiev became absorbed into the ROC and lost any significance. The Russian Orthodox Church held control over what became the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, and for a while, this was not challenged. Meanwhile, on the political side of things, in 1919, two countries, the Ukrainian People's Republic and the West Ukrainian People's Republic, signed the Unification Act, attempting to create an independent and unified Ukraine. Civil war ensued on top of war with neighboring countries, and in 1921, Western Ukraine was ceded to Poland. Later that year, on October 14 through 30 of 1921, Ukrainians held a synod in Kyiv and declared the Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church. But just a year later, in December of 1922, what remained of Ukraine became a founding member of the USSR. The USSR became atheistic, and the Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church initially remained operational. The Soviets wanted control over the churches, and they wanted to pit the UAOC against the ROC to destabilize both. But ultimately, the UAOC came to be persecuted and disappeared from existence within Soviet Ukraine. In 1991, the church was resurrected and began to grow and came to have 3 million members, mostly in western Ukraine. Other Orthodox churches didn't recognize the church officially, but it still was invited to participate in some synods or conferences. That leaves us with two Orthodox churches in Ukraine, but that's not all. In 1990, the Russian Orthodox Church gave more freedom to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, allowing it self-government, but not autocephaly. In 1992, bishops of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church declared that they would operate autocephalously and selected the longtime Metropolitan of Kyiv, Filaret Denisenko, as the church's primate. They then submitted the request of autocephaly to the Patriarch of the ROC. The ROC rejected the request, asked Filaret to resign, which he initially agreed to do, but then recanted, saying he had been pressured. Filaret decided to go forward with declaring an autocephalous church against the will of the ROC in June of the same year, but the bishops didn't go along with him, and when he moved to put his see into the UAOC, he was defrocked, and ultimately he was excommunicated as well. In the end, the Union Filaret sought with the UAOC fell apart, and so a new Third Orthodox Church in Ukraine was formed. In 1995, he became the Patriarch. At this point, it becomes necessary to call these churches by different names. The church Filaret helped establish is the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Kiev Patriarchate, and the church still under the authority of the Russian Orthodox Church is the Ukrainian Orthodox Church Moscow Patriarchate. For two decades, the Kiev Patriarchate was not only viewed as not autocephalous, but the ROC viewed it as a schismatic group that was not truly orthodox. It was not in communion with any orthodox church bodies. With all that background, things really heated up in late 2018. In October, the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople and its leader, the Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople, Bartholomew, moved to grant autocephalous status to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. First, the 1686 letter granting the ROC the ability to appoint the Metropolitan of Kiev was revoked, and the Ecumenical Patriarch stated that it held the jurisdiction over Ukraine. Then the Ecumenical Patriarchate lifted the excommunication of Filaret, which they had previously recognized, and also that of the UAOC's Metropolitan. They declared that although the UAOC and Kiev Patriarchate were not officially recognized, that their sacraments were viewed as being valid. Now the goal was to unite the two churches to produce a new autocephalous Ukrainian church. On December 15, 2018, the Kiev Patriarchate and the Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church dissolved themselves, and the Orthodox Church of Ukraine was formed in a unification council at which at least two bishops from the Russian Orthodox-led Ukrainian Orthodox Church Moscow Patriarchate were also present. In January 2019, it was granted autocephaly by the Ecumenical Patriarchate, something that the Russian Orthodox Church vehemently opposed and refused to recognize. That leaves us today with two Orthodox churches in Ukraine, 
the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, sometimes still identified as the Ukrainian Orthodox Church Moscow Patriarchate, which is under the Russian Orthodox Church, though it has a high level of independence, and the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, not recognized by the ROC, but viewed as autocephalous by the Ecumenical Patriarchate. As of 2018, the former had 12,092 congregations, and in the seven months after forming, a reported 500 of those left for the new church, which in 2019 claimed over 7,000 congregations. The Moscow Patriarchate disputed many of the defections, claiming only 61 parishes transferred. As soon as the new Orthodox Church in Ukraine was declared, the Russian Orthodox Church broke off relations with the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople, leading to a still-continuing schism in the Orthodox Church. On the question of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine's autocephalous status, the Patriarchate of Alexandria, Church of Greece, and Church of Cyprus have formally recognized the Orthodox Church of Ukraine as autocephalous, while others, such as the Greek Orthodox Church of Antioch and Romanian Orthodox Church, have not done so. Meanwhile, Russia and Ukraine are now in a full-scale war. Vladimir Putin has in the past heavily criticized what he claimed was political interference from the ecumenical patriarch, and he's no fan of the new Orthodox Church in Ukraine. It's absolutely certain that this strong tension will shape the two Ukrainian churches even even further. For some, they may no longer want to be part of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church Moscow Patriarchate since it's still under the Russian Orthodox Church, but even though that's the case, its Metropolitan of Kyiv and all Ukraine has stated, Defending the sovereignty and integrity of Ukraine, we appeal to the President of Russia and ask him to immediately stop the fratricidal war. Such a war has no justification either from God or from people. So neither of the churches in Ukraine are truly in favor of the current war. Another consideration for anyone in Ukraine who seeks to attend a church where Russia is less honored is that if Russia were to take over the country, decisions about spiritual matters could have very serious physical consequences.